I believe the Lord had asked me to speak on three things tonight. The three things that uh, I believe the Lord brought to my attention are love, justice, and judgment. Not necessarily things I would choose to speak on, but I have to obey the Holy Spirit because we are living in a time where we have to address certain things within the church and within the body of Christ. So uh, here we go. Kind of scary, isn't it? So, for, uh, for the people on Facebook or YouTube that might not have seen that video, let me just recap a little bit. On August the 16th, 1987, Northwest Airlines Flight 225 crashed just after taking off from the Detroit airport killing 155 people on board, plus two people on the ground. One person survived, a four-year-old girl from Tempe, Arizona, named Cecilia. When rescuers found Cecilia, they did not believe that she had been on the plane. The investigators first assumed that Cecilia had been a passenger in one of the cars on the highway onto which the airliner had crashed. But when the pass passenger register for the flight was checked, there was Cecilia's name. Cecilia survived because even as the plane was falling, Cecilia's mother, Paula Sheehan, unbuckled her own seatbelt, got down on her knees in front of her daughter, wrapped her arms and body around Cecilia, and then would not let go. Let's pray. No greater love but for a man to give his life for another. Lord, we want to thank you for tonight. I want to pray right now that your Holy Spirit will do the ministering. That as I share the words that I believe you've given me, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will bring it home and challenge our hearts to the furtherance and glory of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the first thing I want to talk about tonight is love. That mother had a love for her daughter, wrapping herself at her own peril to save her. You know, Isaiah 49 verse 15 says the following. Could a mother 
forget a child who nurses at her breast? Could she fail to love an infant who came from her own body? Even if a mother could forget, I will never forget you. And then I want to go to John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I have to be honest with you, when I was preparing this message, I started getting emotional as I started to just sense the love of God for His children. The love that He has for each individual one of us. And so we continue. There's so many verses that we could go in. But we continue in Romans chapter 8. And it says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, neither angels nor principalities nor powers, neither things present nor things to come, neither height nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, we might not have that love towards Him, but He has that love towards us. That there is nothing, there is nothing that can separate His love that He has from us. We might not be like that. We might reject Him. We might rebel against Him. And yet, His love toward us is going to remain. It's not going to change. It's going to be the same from day one to the last day. And we all know this scripture. But I had to read it tonight. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but shall have eternal life. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. I wish we would get that. He did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. So as we continue tonight on this message, I want us to understand that the love of God is not going to change. It's going to remain. No matter what you do, no matter what you think, God's love for you is going to remain. So the next point I want to talk about is justice. And I realize that we all have a sense of fairness. We look at a situation and we make a judgment call. And we say, well, that was fair. But you know, when we talk about God, His justice is very different than what we would call justice. It's, it's, it's actually incomprehensible. Because it doesn't match the way we measure things. God measures it differently. But in order for justice to happen, something had to occur that is wrong. And so we find that in Scripture. It says, for all have sinned. Everybody. Everybody has sinned. And come short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6, 23 tells us what the penalty is. The penalty for the wages of sin is death. The penalty is death. But the gift of God is eternal, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then Romans 5.19. For just as through one man's disobedience many were made sinners, 
so by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. How can that be? How can, it go, how can that be that because of one action, it sets the whole course for the rest of, it, of, of the time here on earth? And I was thinking about that, and I realized that even you and me, every decision we make sets a course. See, even decisions that we sometimes think are minor decisions have a cause and effect. And many of the decisions, even things that we think are not that important, cannot be taken back. Once that decision has been made, it sets a path that's going to affect everything after that. And that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. And that's what happened when Jesus fulfilled the law by shedding his blood so that we could be made righteous. So the justice, the justice of God. See, God does not change. So when a law is put into place, that law remains. So the only way around a law is to satisfy the requirement. In this case, penalty. So we go to Romans chapter 10, verse 8 and 9. And here we get hope. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. This is the word of faith that we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know, everybody has their issues. In every generation, we face certain things. I was looking back into history a little bit, and uh, around the year 1200, they started the practice of burning people on the stake. And the thing that became very much in your face was people that were found guilty of, of being witches. You couldn't, you couldn't just shove it under the, the carpet because it was very public. It was right there in your face. You couldn't shy away from it. And so every generation has certain things that are right in our face. And I was thinking about the generation we are in. What is the thing that is in our face right now? And I know the things that I hear over and over that bombard me, both in the church and outside of the church, is homosexuality. You know, I grew up very, very conservative, very old school. Um, you know, when you look in the Old Testament, in the Bible, the Moses' law, homosexuals were to be executed. And I tell you, I was okay with that. But then about eight years, ten years ago, at that time... I had a business in Florida, a smaller town, where a lot of people knew me because I sell advertising, and so I interacted with a lot of people in that town. And it was a small town. And there was a gentleman that was known to be a homosexual. And one day the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to invite him to lunch. I said, what? But 
if I sit with him in a restaurant, people are going to think I am a homosexual. They're going to associate me with him. See, I had to change. I had to change. Because my way was not God's way. Now let's, let's think a little bit about the love scriptures that I shared. God's love changes not. Doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. His love will, whatever you do, cannot separate His love from you. So I'm wondering in the time that we live in, are we comfortable in inviting a gay person into our home? Are we willing to face rejection from our peers because of our association? See, Jesus ministered to the outcast. But he also ministered to the elite. He ministered to the thieves. But he also ministered to the victims. He also ate with sinners. And he welcomed prostitutes. Now, now picture this. You have invited some guests to your house for dinner. Important people. And as you sit down to dinner, there's a knock on the door. And you go and open the door, and there you see a prostitute that you know, everybody knows she's a prostitute. She's not invited. And she sweet talks her way into your house. And in front of all your guests, she comes and flails herself at your feet. And starts to weep. Undoes her hair and wipes your feet with her hair. Embarrassing. You must be kidding. That, is, that would be very embarrassing. But God's love supersedes what we think is proper. It doesn't look at who she is. It looks at the soul that God created. And when we look at the things that we face today, we have to recognize that people have been made in the image of God. See, I've been made in the image of God. You have been made in the image of God. But the guy that does drugs or the alcoholic or the homosexual, they are also made in the image of God. What do we do with that? Do we love them? The Bible says it's the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that draws people to Him. It's not the judgment. It's not the judgment. It's the goodness. God did not send His Son to condemn the world. But He sent His Son so that the world might be saved. Justice. Well, let's look at some justice. 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know? Don't you know that the un unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexuals, 
This is in the Bible, guys. I did not make this up. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That's our kind of justice, right? You do this, ah, you're not going to get the reward. There was a time when I looked at people. God's working on me, see? This time when I looked at people and I passed judgment. And I said, well, Romans chapter 1 tells me that if you do certain things that you are given over to a debased mind. Therefore, the things that are completely wrong and sinful, you justify and you believe they are okay. And isn't that where we are? People believe that what they do is actually quite fine. But you see, there's another verse after verse 10. And it says this, such were some of you. If you look at the sins of others and you do not recognize the sin in your own life, you've missed the boat. Remember the parable about the splinter in your brother's eye and the log in yours? So verse 11, such were some of you. What's he talking about? Sexually immoral people. Male prostitutes. Homosexuals. And God fulfilled the law, the penalty, by giving his life. Just like that mother did for Cecilia. And as a result, you were washed. You were sanctified. And you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. You know, the prophet Zechariah had a vision, and it's, it's beautiful to me. And I'm going to share that vision with you tonight because it, it just fits just right. And we find it in Zechariah 3. From verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Let me just stop right there a little bit. Satan accuses people all the time. As if our conscience is not enough, he will add shame and guilt to what we deep inside know is not right. He's the accuser. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. Is this not a burning brand taken out of the fire? I don't know whether you've ever had a campfire. I, I love little campfires. And uh, when I get ready to leave the campfire place or go to bed, there are some logs that are half burnt. And I will take them out of the fire in order to extinguish, make the fire go out faster. Those logs are not perfect anymore. They are burnt. Half of them is gone into ashes. And this verse says that God plucked such a log out of the fire because he still saw something in that log. He still sees something in you and in me. Verse 3. Now Joshua had on filthy garments.
and was standing before the angel. And then he said to those standing before him, take off his filthy garments. Then he said, see, I have removed from you your iniquity. And I will clothe you with rich robes. People, we are at a time where it's critical that we don't write people off because they have tattoos, ear piercings, nose piercings, belly button piercings, or because they have sexual tendencies that we don't agree with, or because they are drunkards, or because they do drugs and party all night, all weekend long, from Friday till Monday morning. I, I, I used to have a friend uh, many, many years ago as a police officer. When he got his pay on a Friday, he drank it all out. By Monday morning, all his money was gone. We cannot write those people off because God does not write them off. See, such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. He sets people free no matter where you're at. I love what Don said two weeks ago. He was ministering here. He said, you do not clean yourself up to, you do not clean yourself up to come to God. You come to God to be cleaned up. See, when Christ comes into your life, or when Christ comes into somebody else's life that we have already judged, he changes them. He changes them from darkness into light. I have a gentleman that occasionally works for me, and uh, he grew up, his dad is a Muslim. And so naturally, he is a Muslim too. His mother is a Christian. And his mother got very sick, so he promised his mother, he says, I'm going to give my heart to the Lord Jesus. And he did. The church he went to had an altar call. Praise God. He responded to the altar call. He made Jesus the Lord of his life. He got baptized. The next time he came and worked for me, he couldn't stop laughing. He was so happy. As before, he was always... His face was always dark. But now there was a lightness in his step. This was about two weeks after he had given his heart to the Lord. See, he changes us from darkness to light. From death to life. Let me say this to you. If you do not have the Lord Jesus Christ, you're dead already. You don't even know what life is. We, f we fill our life with things that we think are going to satisfy us. I, I, just, I just heard from a single mother who's heartbroken. Her teenage son is living with a 24-year-old man. Her heart is broken. But that young man is yearning for some attention. He's yearning to satisfy something in his life. He started with pornography and he ended up in a homosexual relationship. God changes us from death to life. He makes us into a new creation. I think we've got something wrong about salvation. We, we, we look at salvation as a ticket to heaven. But that's not the purpose of salvation. Salvation, the purpose of salvation is to change us. 
to change us from darkness to light, from death to life. See, my righteousness does not come from me. It comes from Christ. What he did, he died. He gave his life. He fulfilled that law that said the penalty for sin is death. So he said, I will take your penalty. Your penalty is death. I will take that penalty. Now, we cannot ignore the truth about sin. We cannot condone a lifestyle of sin. But we should always have the Spirit of Christ when we deal with situations like this. See, Matthew chapter 7 says the following. Enter the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who are going through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life. There are few who find it. Let's make no mistake. We cannot widen the gate to accommodate everyone. But what we can do is we can present to everyone the life-giving spirit of Jesus Christ. That love, that love that supersedes our understanding. It's, it's difficult for me to understand how anybody, if they truly understand how much, lo- how much God really loves you, to turn away from Him. And as we are in this age that we live in, we need to present the love of God to people. Not the condemnation that we so easily give into, but the love of Christ That love that shed his blood for you and also for the man on the outside. Now there are some hard scriptures. And when we speak about the word of God, we have to look at all of the word of God. 1 John 3 verse 8 verse 9, 8 to 9 says, Whoever practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was revealed that he might destroy the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not practice sin, for his seed remains in God's seed remains in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. There is a difference between somebody that has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and somebody that does not, has not. We need to stop condemning those people that have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like you were blind at one point. You didn't have the revelation that you have now. So don't condemn those that haven't had that revelation. But when you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, then yes, you cannot continue the way you lived before. Finally, I want to talk about judgment. There is a judgment. See, Revelation uh, 20, verse 12 and 15 says the following. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. Books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works as recorded in the books. Anyone, anyone's name who's, anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I'm going to make a very, very important statement here. Please bear with me. 
We do not go to hell because of our sins. The judgment is not, did you sin today? No. The judgment is whether your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So the question is this, because on this it hinges the judgment. What did you do with Jesus Christ? That's the only criteria. Love, justice, judgment. But, but, but above all is love. And so if we confess our sins, I stand here before you tonight. It, and I want to tell you, I want to tell you on Facebook, I want to tell you on YouTube when you watch this. If you confess your sins, it doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter who you are. Jesus is faithful towards you. He's just. His justice is to forgive you. And to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. If you are battling tonight with anything, I want to ask you with, with a great emotion in my heart because I've, I've experienced God's love when I prepared this message. I want to ask you tonight, stick your pride in your pocket and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I make you the Lord of my life. Because I yearn for true life, for true satisfaction. May God bless you.